is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's good to be in worship with you today on such a marvelous spring morning. I'm Alicia Besser. I'm the senior pastor here at Moody Methodist Church. And it's always an honor to be in worship with you. Um, in your bulletin, you'll see that there's a connect card on this side of your uh, bulletin. The page folds over. If you will write down your name and address and contact information and fill that out, whether you're a guest or a returning guest or a Moody member, um, then this will help us to know who's in worship with us and to reach out to you in the future. On the opposite side is a prayer request. We are a praying church. And at 8 o'clock every Sunday morning, there's a group that meets, and they pray over all the concerns. And then during the week, the staff prays over all of the concerns. And so you're invited to list any concern or joy that we can celebrate on this side of the card. Then, here, we'll do the holy tear all together. One, two, three, rip. You can place it in the offering as it comes past you later in the service. You'll notice that there are ribbons on the chancel rail. When you come up for Holy Communion, these ribbons represent our prayers. So when you come up, you're invited to pick up a ribbon. To me, colors have meaning. Um, you might pick a blue or a yellow to represent Ukraine. You might pick up a green one to represent a, a prayer for new life in a loved one's um, life. Y you pick up the color you like. And then as you go back to your seat, you put, simply put them in the vases on the tables beside you. We, after following the service, we will tie them on our prayer fences outside. Why do we have those prayer fences? Well, it's a witness to the world that we believe not only does God hear our prayers, but God answers our prayers. Just today, um, Bob Aubrey was telling me about a prayer request that he's had and how the Lord answered it. We believe that God hears our prayers and answers our prayers. And those fences are witnesses to the world. And we invite the world to come along on the journey and to pray with us and to trust God to work in their lives. So you're invited to participate that and that uh, during Holy Communion. Um, before we offer the announcements on the video, just want to point out as you lead the service, if you're wondering about the lily, uh, purchasing a lily for Easter, it's a way to dedicate it to someone you love or, or an honor in memory of someone, you can pick these up as you leave the service today. There are, they're on tables on either side of the sanctuary uh, for, your, for your pleasure. Now let's draw our attention to the screens. Hey everyone, I want to invite you to a special opportunity we have. On Wednesday, April 6th at 6.30, Rabbi Matt, the rabbi over at Congregation B'nai Israel right here in Galveston, is going to come and do a special, over, special Passover meal and class for us. Uh, this will be a great opportunity to learn more about the history of Passover uh, as we are preparing for Holy Week that takes place during Passover. So how does that connect? What was the world that Jesus was living in? And what was that ritual that he was a part of? But beyond that, it's a really special time where we, uh, as people of faith, can think about what does it mean to pass on our faith to the next generation? Uh, Rabbi Matt says that the Passover meal is designed to get kids to ask the question, Mom, why do we do this? Why are we doing it? Why do we have this thing here? Why are we eating this bitter herb? Why are we uh, drinking this juice? What is this for? And it becomes a chance to explain the faith of the scripture and how it shows up in our own life too. So this will be a really great opportunity. I want to invite you again uh, this one time, April 6th uh, at 6.30. Uh, we'll have this Passover meal together and the rabbi will lead us in that. Uh, now this will be more of a ceremonial meal than a full meal, so you can join us at 5.30 in the CLC uh, for a meal beforehand, or you'll probably want to eat something beforehand and join us uh, for this really great opportunity. 
Uh, it's great for kids and families, so you're welcome to come. Uh, bring your kids, bring your families. It's a great opportunity for all of us. Uh, you can let us know you're coming, uh, just so we know how many supplies to bring at moody.org slash register. Thanks, and I hope to see you there. Hey guys, my name's Derek. I'm the Assistant Youth Director here at Moody Methodist Church, and I've got some news for all of my current 5th through 12th graders. On Sundays, on the last Sunday of every month, that means currently this Sunday, we have our Sunday Fun Days going on, where we will open up the gym here at our church for you to all come and have fun with us. There will be a lunch provided, and we'll just have fun. There'll be a, maybe dodgeball if we get enough people, because I haven't played dodgeball in a while, so I'm ready to kind of like get going with it, guys. We can play nine square. Anything that y'all want to do that we have, we'll play it here. So join us this Sunday from noon to 2.30, or on the last Sunday of every month for Sunday Fun Days. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Donna Lang, and I am delighted to invite you to come to lunch on April 10th after the Palm Sunday services here. For the last year, I have been so blessed to be part of a team here at the church that has been exploring what is our church vision? What makes us unique? We've been talking for months about what God has planted us here in Galveston, Texas, specifically to be called to his church. It says, we discovered our kingdom concept, the simple, clear, big idea that defines how our church will glorify God and make disciples. I know that seems really complicated, but we wanna share with you something that looks like a vision frame. This frame is gonna give us a tool so that we can figure out then how we step into that with a strategic plan and with new initiatives that work for this church. I am constantly amazed by the blessings that we have and that means each and every one of you. You are what make up this church and we need to hear your voice. Please think about joining us and making that space in your schedule. We want you to learn more about this vision frame that we can talk about that can guide us to the future. And then on May 1st, we're gonna ask the church to vote and approve that, that vision statement for us so that we can go forward. And just to give you an idea of what that is, one side of that frame is a statement of that kingdom concept. And it says, we serve alongside our neighbors to transform our community through Christ's love. Please join us on April 10th that we can talk about how we are going to be that transformational place for Galveston Island. Okay, our videos were having problems, but the rest of the screen is good. That's good news. Our call to worship. From the wanderings of our lives, we have come to gather here. Come here, offering your lives before God.
who'd like to request something this morning? Yes, sir. 431. We'll sing it in its entirety. We don't have time for all the stanzas, so they're all wonderful, but let's just do one and three. Four, five. Praise 
Good morning. Do we have any children here this morning? If so, you come forward. There they are. Whoa. <laughs> Good morning. You can come sit up here. Yeah. How are you this morning? You doing good? Today we're going to uh, read a scripture from Luke, and we're reading it from chapter 14, verses 12 and 14. And it says, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had a party? Yeah? I had a party. Um... Um, birthdays are almost like a party. Yeah, birthdays are a party. For my birthday, I had a slumber party. Yeah, and did you have, have you had a party? You, I'm not sure. So yeah. Oh, okay. So we've had parties. You send invitations for those parties? Yeah. Did you have to invite some of your friends and not everybody? How do you feel if you don't get an invitation to a party? How do you feel if you don't get an invitation? Um, I um, feel when I get an invitation, I feel sad. Yeah, if you don't get an invitation, you feel sad. It makes us feel sad. But if we, uh, if we leave somebody out, do you think they might feel sad? Yeah. yeah. So this Bible verse is talking about inviting those people. Sometimes we invite people because we know that if we invite them to our party, then they'll invite us to their party, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do that because we have really close friends. But this is reminding us to invite those people to parties that sometimes are always left out, the least of us. Maybe it's somebody who doesn't, is new to your class and doesn't have a whole lot of friends, Maybe it's somebody who's just really shy and doesn't talk too much, so people don't tend to think of them. It's reminding us to think of those people that are least among us. Because Jesus said when we have a party, that not to invite those people that we would always invite right away. Invite those people that are left out. So when we do that, we're acting like Jesus. So we're going to remember that when we have a party, sometimes to think of those that are left out sometimes, okay? What you got? Um, when I get left out, um, I feel really sad for my friends. Yeah, we do. We feel sad when we're left out, so those other people will too. So we're going to remember that today. So can we say a prayer real quick? Let's put our hands together and pray. Father, help us to be loving and caring towards those who may not have as much as we have. Help us to include them in special things that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great day. As fast as they come, he goes. <laughs>
We remember that you made us in your image and we thank you for giving us families, mothers and fathers, friends and people to share our lives with and that we're not alone. As we think about our church and our earthly families, help us to remember, remember how, to forget, how you forgave our sins and make us messengers of your reconciling love to share with others. And when we feel alone, help us to remember that we're truly not alone. And in those moments, to share you most of all. In this moment of silence, please ask God to show each one of us the part that he wants us to play in our church lives. Creator God, as we pray for the world, we ask that you take from us all the hatred and prejudice. Give us your spirit of love for the people, whatever race or creed. We continue to pray for those affected by COVID over these past two years. We also lift Ukraine and we pray for all those who have loved ones, who have lost loved ones, those who have been forced to leave their homes and people who continue to live in fear. We ask that you give them strength and courage and we ask that you give strength and courage to the leaders of all nations involved so they work tirelessly to find peace and bring an end to this and other conflicts in the world. In this moment of silence, please pray for any country that you are concerned about today. Almighty God, we pray for our local community. We ask that each of us will make use of our individual talents that you have provided us with to enable each church group to flourish as a witness to you so that we can serve our friends and our neighbors who are in need. Loving God, we ask for your healing touch on all who are ill and suffering in body, mind, and spirit. We especially pray for anybody we know who is experiencing emotional pain, a broken heart, or broken spirit because of personal or family problems. In this moment of silence, please pray for loved ones that you, or people that you know who are in need of God's help today. Almighty God, we ask that you draw close to you all those mentioned in these silent prayers. Help bring, bring us aware of your healing presence. Help us to provide your peace and your comfort to those around us at all times. Everlasting God, we remember that you brought us into this world. You have brought us to the point that we are here to cherish your son, Jesus Christ, in this time of Lent. And we especially bring to you those today that we love and that we don't see anymore. We ask you to draw close all those who are grieving today over loss of a loved one. Father God, send us out into the world renewed by our worship and strengthened by our fellowship so that we may be a witness of your gospel and your son, Jesus Christ, and bring healing and reconciliation to the wounded world around us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Join me in prayer in the Lord's Prayer so we can all pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Will those helping with offering come forward, please? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can always trust you, that you are a God of abundance. 
and out of your greatness and mercy you have given us so much. We give to you this offering today as a token of our appreciation for your love and your gentleness in our lives. We ask that you will work with this gift to bring glory to your kingdom. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel today is from Luke 14, chapters, verses 1 through 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, 
Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. When he noticed how the guest chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host and the host who invited both, you, both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humiliated and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Growing up here in Galveston, I didn't listen to much country Western music until I went to A&M. And in the first semester of my freshman year, um, I was invited to a George Strait concert. I was thrilled. So I put on my best pair of denim shorts and my little flats, and I was ready to go to the concert. When the guys from Irving showed up, in their Wrangler jeans and boots and looked me up and down and said, what are you wearing? I knew right then and there, I wasn't much of a country girl. But I learned to appreciate country music throughout my college experience and into my adult life. And wouldn't God have a sense of humor uh, when, he, when I was introduced to Robert, my husband. Now, if you've met my husband and you've heard his voice for more than three seconds, you know that he's a country boy. He's from Conroe. Now, when you think of Conroe, you think of the suburbs. That's not where he's from. I mean, he's from the sticks of Conroe. His daddy's garden was as big as one side of the sanctuary. And I love that about him. I find his accent charming. And while he enjoys all kinds of music, at, at heart, it's country western that he loves. So last summer, when we planned a vacation out to Nashville, I made a point of scheduling a tour and tickets to the Grand Old Opry. Right? We couldn't go to Nashville without going to the Grand Ole Opry. And he was so excited. We took the VIP tour and we got to look in the dressing rooms and see all the plaques, all the names. Uh, we were to hear Reba McIntyre. She was the one showcased that evening. And we were super excited. By the end of that night, my husband was already on the phone getting tickets for the next week. We were spending about 10 days there um, to see who else we could hear at the Grand Old Opry. I mean, it was exciting. And so he found that Leanne Womack, a good Texas girl from Jacksonville, Texas, was playing. So, of course, we got tickets, right? But here's what we noticed. There's a, a wall of plaques telling you all of the members of the Grand Old Opry. All kinds of people like Trisha Yearwood and Blake Shelton, all kinds of people. But there were some names that were missing on the wall. One was Leanne Womack, and we thought that was odd. She was singing at the Grand Old Opry, but her name wasn't there. Willie Nelson's name isn't there. And the king of country, George Strait, is not a member of the Grand Ole Opry. How can that be? Last Sunday, his concert was sold out for the rodeo. 
even if you don't like country music, you know George Strait is a pretty big deal. <laughs> so I wondered about this, why? Why were these people missing from the list? Well, I'm not really sure about Leanne Womack because actually she's performed there numerous times and the type of music that she sings fits into their genre. So I, I'm not sure about Leanne Womack. But the puzzle started fitting together when I found out that Willie Nelson was inducted into the Hall of Fame, I mean, not the Hall of Fame, the Grand Ole Opry in 1965. But he gave up his membership in 1972 because the requirement for the Grand Ole Opry membership is that you have to show up at the Opry on a frequent basis. So living in Texas is a problem. He gave up his membership when he moved back to Central Texas. And now we know why George Strait's not in the Grand Ole Opry. George Strait lives um, outside of San Antonio on a ranch. And if you know anything about George Strait, he, he doesn't really care about putting on airs. And so um, he wasn't willing to make uh, the trips back to Nashville to be in the Grand Ole Opry, so he's never been invited. These people, I surmise, uh, aren't invited into this grand group because their dinner tables reside in Texas. We're talking about dinner tables today. That's what Jesus is talking about. On so, it, it starts with a picture of a dinner table. We might even think of a communion table, right? Or maybe it's the dinner table at your house. But Jesus is talking about dinner tables. He is meeting with the uh, Pharisees. He's been invited to dinner at the head Pharisee's house. I mean, this is a really big deal. If you were here last Sunday, you remember that the Pharisees were kind of the keepers of the law. They taught the law. But oftentimes they said one thing and they did another thing. And they didn't, um, they didn't bear good witness to people, right? They weren't a, always a good influence. But Jesus is invited to this uh, dinner. Second, notice it is the Sabbath. That means it is the high holy day of the week. This is an important meal. Sabbath, for Sabbath, for our Jewish brothers and sisters, there are three important meals. The Friday night dinner, which is um, significant, a, a Saturday kind of breakfast sort of meal, and then Saturday at sundown. And so Jesus was invited to one of these meals. It was a, a, a grand thing. Imagine Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or Easter lunch, you know, that's coming up. A big old feast that maybe your grandmother made, you know, that was just uh, more food than anybody ever needed. That's, that's the situation. And at the very beginning, there's this dialogue about healing on the Sabbath because there's a person in the midst um, the scripture said dropsy. Others have said distended abdomen. But there's somebody with an illness. And I'll tell you, they're not seated at the table. Because they would have been seen as unclean. So Jesus encounters this person on the edge. And he, instead of the Pharisees questioning him, he turns the tables. And they're too afraid to answer <laughs> right? They're just, they're not saying a word because they've been caught before. But Jesus extends grace to this person. He sees their pain and their suffering and he heals them before the dinner ever starts. And then Jesus notices where everybody is seated at the table. Now, Michael, will you show that Last Supper picture? When we think of how people are seated at a dinner table in Jesus' time, we often think of this picture. Even though it's kind of quirky looking there, you can look on the back screen if you want. You know Leonardo da Vinci's picture. This is not how people were seated in Jesus' day. It's a nice picture, but that's not all how people were seated. Michael, could you show the next picture? I was trying to give you an idea. This isn't the world's best, but it was really a U-shaped table. And if we begin, well, we'll just pretend um, on the far left, the host was seated in the second seat 
on the far left. On his right, on the very end, was probably one of his best friends. Somebody close to him, a friend. And then the seat of honor, the honored guest, was to his left. And then it was a hierarchy of most important people going around from left to right. So the person seated at the very end of the table on the far right would have been the person of lowest status, often a servant, so they could get up and uh, tend to the needs of the group. Now here's, this is not a part of the scripture day. Here's a little bit of tidbit information. Judas was seated on Jesus' left. And historians believe that Peter was seated at the servant's seat. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. But people were seated in sort of a hierarchy of the day. And so I can imagine it's a, Michael, you can turn that off. No, you can leave it up, leave it up. Uh, I can imagine, you know, how dinner parties are. Okay, we're ready to eat. Everybody find a seat. And Jesus notices how people are seating, how they're sort of jockeying to get to the farthest left side, right? They're taking up a seat of honor. And uh, Jesus looks into the situation. He says, basically, uh, don't be so quick to take the seat of honor. Instead, take the lowest seat, the seat to the far right, the servant seat. Sit down there because what you don't want to happen, which was culturally appropriate, is that someone of greater status would show up on the scene and then your host would come along and say, here, I've, I'm sorry, you need to move because uh, Josephine is more important than you. You need to go down there. And it's the walk of shame. Can you imagine? I mean, I would be so humiliated. It is, it is awkward. And it's a warning to the Pharisees. And it's a warning to us to not think so highly of ourselves. We get so caught up in this idea of prestige and importance. We want to be important. I am somebody, right? But Jesus is challenging us to take the seat of the servant to humble ourselves, to recognize that well, we can always, if we're seated in, at the lowest seat, well, the host might notice that and say, oh no, Josephine, come on up here. You need to be right next to me. And we'll never be embarrassed or shamed. I think what Jesus is not saying that Jesus knows is that often, you know, the seat at the back of the banquet or the end of the table where the rowdy crowd sits, they're the most fun, right? Don't you know it? Have you ever been to one of those weddings where it's assigned seating and you're seated next to the people you're supposed to be seated with? But off in the back, you hear giggles and stories and you're like, oh, if I could only be seated back there with them because they're way more fun. Because sometimes people who we don't share the same experiences with same places in life, well, we have the most to learn from them if we'll only humble ourselves and see the value in all kinds of people, all kinds of people. It's all about humility. In this passage, Jesus is inviting us to humble ourselves. I've been so struck uh, by Dolly Parton. I know I'm on a country western music kick, but Many of you have heard this. Dolly Parton, famous country western singer, was invited to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Woo, what's she doing? I guess that's for the song Nine to Five. And we all know that Dolly Parton is a popular figure right now. She does a lot in the community there in Tennessee, but really nationally and worldwide. And so they, my assumption is they wanted to honor her. Um, and so they gave her this nomination for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Dolly Parton turned it down. <laughs> she, um, she said, that's very kind of you, uh, but I haven't earned this right. 
Someday I hope to produce a rock album. Her husband really likes rock and roll music, not country. And she hopes to do a rock and roll album. And maybe when she does that album, she'll earn the right to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But right now, um, that's not her place at the table. And she's afraid that she will split the vote and that well-deserving people will not get the honor. They'll be seated at the end of the table and she'll be seated on the left just because of a popularity contest. So Dolly turned it down. Friends, that's humility. That's knowing um, your gifts and your strengths, but also um, that you're not any better than anybody else. It's recognizing the gifts of other people that they bring. It's raising them up because of those gifts and understanding it doesn't make you less. We're all just regular, ordinary people. It doesn't matter if we're famous or have a PhD behind our name or an MBA or whatever pedigree we think. Everybody in front of Jesus, we're we're all the same. And a humble person learns to see the value of the differences, learns from other people that are not like them or dares to find the common ground and people that outwardly look vastly different. Sometimes what gets in our way is our own arrogance and our own stereotypes and our own box that we've put in the world as to what is good and what is not, what is of higher status and what is of lower status. I was visiting with a friend uh, this week and I asked about another mutual friend. This was a person that grew up in this church that I hadn't seen in a while and and so I asked about him. And um, now this person is remarkable. I mean, he got a full scholarship honor scholarship to a top-notch university when he graduated from Ball High. He would go on to graduate school and get a double master's. Incredible. But I asked about this person. And you know, they haven't found a job in their field. You see, because the, the world says this is the box. This is what beauty and a successful person looks like. And this person doesn't look that way. And yet, he's brilliant. He has more gifts to offer our community than anybody I know. And the shame is, we're missing out. Because we, people like us, won't give him a chance. Because outward appearances don't match what people think of as inward qualities. And we can't look inward enough to give him a chance. Jesus is challenging us in this verse to humble ourselves and see the value of people. That's the second part of this um, message. He says, you, you're gonna have a dinner party? Don't invite your family. Don't invite the people that can invite you to their birthday party as Lance was talking about, right? Uh, that's normal. It was a system of reciprocity. If I invite you to dinner, I expect you to invite me to dinner in return. But Jesus said, no, um, invite the crippled and the blind and the lame. Another way of saying that is the people on the margins, the people that don't fit in this pretty nice, neat box that the world created. The people we sometimes call other. We, the world is labeled, well, they're other, they're different. I have a friend named Jeannie. Her mother is one of my best friends who just happens to be 84 years old. I mean, uh, 90 years old. Betty is 90 now. Um, And Jeannie has a daughter named Heather. Heather's in her 20s. But when Jeannie was pregnant with Heather, uh, Jeannie contracted RSV and gave it to the baby, to Heather. And Heather, only half of Heather's brain developed. Heather is a delight. And in the school district in which she grew up, 
children like Heather that were in wheelchairs were mainstreamed. And I wondered how that worked. Did Heather understand what was going on around her? I, I don't know. But here's what I know. Heather was everyone's best friend. To the kid who didn't have a friend, they sat with Heather at lunch. The cheerleaders all wanted Heather to be a cheerleader because they, they thought that would be neat. Instead of defining her as different, her parents, her teachers, the people around her defined her as spectacular. And so she was invited to the banquet table. And in return, there were children who didn't have a place at the banquet table, but because of Heather, they were invited as well. Now this banquet table is more than just the table. In Jesus' day, the table represented your, their social life. If you were invited to dinner at my house, it meant that you were my friend, you were a part of my life, you were important to me. But I think Jesus would expand this out as who's in your social circle? Who do you include, not only in your dinner conversation, but who do you invite to go play cards? Who do you invite to the Mardi Gras parade with you? Who do you include in your life? And so often we get in this habit and we draw a little circle around our friends. These are the people we know. We have common experience, uh, common likes, dislikes, and we draw a little circle. And we might expand out that circle because our friends' friends might be included sometimes. Or maybe our kids' friends are included in the circle. But the circle is defined. And the problem is when we have that circle, then we look inward. And we're all looking at each other and we're all pretty similar. I believe everybody walks into a room and says, who in this room is like me? And if we don't find that common person we're likely to leave. And Jesus says to us today, you go be that common person. You go be the person that reaches out, that invites the people that might be on the margins for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're new to our community. I'm gonna say something that's not popular, but it is true. Galveston is not an easy place. Galveston, people from Galveston are kind. People from Galveston are friendly. But like most small cities, people already have their defined circle of friends. So it is difficult for new people to come along and to participate. But what if we, what if we threw away the box? What if we looked at people and said, I want to know what I can learn from you. And I want to know what I can learn from you. And I want to know what I can learn from you. What if we, saw, we, we set about our lives to seek to discover the value in people from their experiences, from their wisdom? Maybe it's from their sense of humor. There are all kinds of people. And here's what I love the most about God is who God puts on my heart might be different than who God puts on Zago's heart might be different than who God puts on Kathy's heart, right? And when we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit to say, I want to invite to the table different people. I want to include in my circle all kinds of people. The Holy Spirit can and will lead us. One last thought. Donna, in the opening um, the opening video of announcements mentioned that on April 10th, we are going to have a, uh, we're gonna explain the mission and vision of the church um, and what that vision frame looks like. She read it to you, I will read it to you again. It says uh, that our, our mission statement is, the Moody Methodist Church is a congregation that seeks to serve alongside our neighbors to transform our community through Christ's love. It's a beautiful statement, but friends, it is also challenging because it's a mandate to us to turn around and look and see who's not at the table and why aren't they here and what can I do about it? How can I invite them along on this journey of faith? 
It's about seeing the value in all kinds of people. And Jesus says to us when we, when we do that, when we humble ourselves and we don't see ourselves as better than other people and we include all the people that the rest of the world says, ah, they're just different, they're, they're other than us. Well, when we, we include them and we make them part of us, that there is a blessing in it and we know it. Oh, it is so much fun. There's an old saying that says, joy means Jesus, others, and ourselves. Jesus, others, and you. That if we prioritize our lives, Jesus first, others second, ourselves last, that we'll be happy. We'll be blessed. And it's true. Because when we stop and we look for the people that need a place at the table, we discover such meaning and such power in our lives and the beauty of God at work and all kinds of people. And we find joy as we bring them to the table of grace. That's my prayer for us today. As Jesus talks about the dinner table, may we become people that shatter the box of expectations, that turn outward and look for those who don't have a place and bring them in to the glory of God. Amen. It's a time in our service in which we come to the table. We come to the table humbly because at this moment in front of Jesus, we're just, we're just nothing. We are created in the image of God and yet we make mistakes all the time. But by God's grace, we are forgiven and we come believing and knowing that, hoping. And so we remember that night in which a group of his friends who would betray him sat around that table, Judas at his left side in the seat of honor. And Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, and remember me. When the supper was over, he took the cup of salvation. He asked God to bless it. And then he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, many, many different kinds of people. And so we ask God to pour out his Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine that they may be for the, bo the body and blood of Christ to us, that we may be this gift to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to have just a moment of silence as Lance and I prepare the table. And then you'll be invited to come down the center aisle. If you're new with us, you simply cup your hands. We will drop a piece of bread into your hand and we will give you a small cup of juice. If you would like prepackaged, we have that. If you need gluten-free, we have that as well. All you have to do is mention it to us and we'll be happy to serve you. You're welcome to kneel at the chancel rail as long as you like. Pick up a ribbon. Maybe that ribbon for you represents someone in your life who needs to be at the table and they're not here. Who is that person? Allow us to pray with you for that person and then you can drop it in the vases as you go back. Let's take just a moment of silence. Just a reminder, if you're new with us, this is an open table. This is the Lord's table. It's not a Methodist table. All who believe in Jesus, who desire to know Christ, are invited to come and to receive. The table is set. Please come.
such holy space. And it excites me to think how God will invite us to carve out holy space for people we don't know, to hear stories we can't imagine, because God is at work in all kinds of people's lives. It is a holy moment. Now, just a, an invitation before we go to the invitation for Christian discipleship. Um, I want to say, I want to invite you to an opportunity. We are, as I visit with people around campus, uh, they're constantly telling me, Alicia, we want to see our church packed out with kids. We, we want young families to feel welcome here. And so do I. And our number one place in which we can reach kids is through our day school. If you don't know this, we have a huge day school right over there. And every afternoon, we need a greeter. For the last month, uh, the staff has uh, filled these slots. But I've noticed it's a little much for us <laughs> on our own, so I'm inviting you. Guess what? It is super easy. All you have to do is say, hello, how are you? What is your child's name or who are you here to pick up? And you get to use a walkie-talkie. I mean, it doesn't that say fun, a walkie-talkie? I know what you're thinking. I can't stand on my feet. It's, only, it's an hour for one shift or 30 minutes for the 5 o'clock shift. It's 4 o'clock to 5 or 5 to 5.30. It goes by super fast. And every single day that I stand out there with the kids, I am blessed because they are filled with joy and life. And what I've noticed is that the parents, as they come walking toward me and they see my smile, well, some of the stress of their day, I hope, goes away. And they um, experience God's grace through us. And it's a welcoming presence from the church to our school. And you can be a part of that. We just need you to be a greeter. It's a Monday through Friday, like I said, 4 o'clock. Or you can do a 30-minute slot, 5 to 5.30. I'm going to put this in the welcome center. I'll set the pages all out. All you got to do is sign up. I promise we'll remind you when to be there and what to do. But it's a lot of fun. And I hope that you'll come along on that journey. Now, I want to invite you to stand as we sing our final song. If you've been visiting with us for a while and you want to make Moody your church home, or maybe God's moving in your life and you want to rededicate your life or make a first-time commitment to Christ, come down during the singing of this last hymn and I would be happy to have a conversation with you. But let's sing together.
one last thing, if there's anyone in the room that would like to help uh, tie the prayer ribbons onto the vent, we need two people to do that for our service. It's a wonderful opportunity. You just go right after the service and tie the ribbons. I'm going to set this greeter opportunity in the Welcome Center. You're welcome to sign up there. Now receive the benediction. Go out with the love of God. Knowing that everybody's invited to the banquet. Look to see who God is calling you to invite. And bring the, and, and call them with grace. Invite them with God's love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.